In 1987, during the First Intifada, while Palestinians were fighting against Israeli control, Hamas emerged. It later became one of the most brutal terrorist organizations in history. It wasn't exactly a grand, fiery entrance, more like a branch sprouting from the old tree of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Since the 50s, this Brotherhood crew had been planting their ideas in Gaza, doing it on the down low. They set up charities, clinics and schools, which sounds all good and community-like, but it was their way of spreading their influence nice and steady. So how did Hamas actually start out? In the early days, Hamas strutted around like some kind of peace-loving, reform-minded outfit, avoiding messy tangles with Israel. But as time ticked on, they got a taste for the spotlight and power's addictive kick. It wasn't long before they dived headfirst into the cutthroat world of Palestinian politics, ditching their earlier, milder stance for a beefier, head-on approach. In the 1990s, things took a darker turn with the emergence of the Is ad-Din al-Qassam brigades, the armed wing of Hamas. They stepped up their game, targeting both civilians and the Israeli military. These actions, including suicide bombings that drew a lot of attention, led many countries to label them a terrorist group. They became infamous on the global stage for these acts. Israel's response? Classic cat and mouse game snatch and deport Hamas activists. But it was like trying to plug a leaky boat, endless and seemingly pointless. Hamas's leaders? Think of them as characters from some controversial club. Guys like Ismail Haniyeh, Yahya Sinwar and the gang, all tangled up in fights with Israel and deep in militant stuff. They're playing a complex game, pulling strings from Qatar to Turkey after falling out with Syria. They're like chess pieces in a Middle East-wide game, trying to outmaneuver each other. How did Hamas jump into politics? In the mid-2000s, Hamas, notorious for mixing militant actions with political ambitions, decided to play the political game. In 2005, they jumped into the fray and surprise, surprise, by 2006, they clinched a majority in the Palestinian legislative elections. This win wasn't just big, it was a game changer wrapped in controversy. True to form, Hamas stuck to its guns, refusing to give up violence or recognize Israel. This led to Israel and the US cutting off aid, tightening their wallets. After 2005, with Israel stepping out of Gaza, Hamas took control, ruling with strict Sharia laws. Their money situation is a mixed bag. There's cash coming from Palestinian expats, wealthy donors in the Persian Gulf, and Islamic charities. And Iran, acting like a financial godfather, allegedly pumps in a hefty $100 million a year in funds, weapons, and training. Plus. Hamas makes its own money by taxing goods coming into Gaza, especially after Egypt and Israel clamped down with a blockade post their election win. Despite changing tactics, their commitment to Palestinian independence remains constant but controversial. Looking at the bigger picture, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict dates back to the early 20th century. Jewish migration to Palestine, especially during the Fifth Aliyah from 1929 to 1939, ignited Arab-Jewish tensions. The era was marked by violence, setting the stage for future conflicts and paving the way for groups like Hamas. Hamas, in their 1988 charter, really went hard against Israel and had some anti-Semitic stuff, calling for wiping out Israel. This is a big reason why lots of countries call them a terrorist group. While the other side mostly wants to defend itself, we've seen a lot of low-budget, poorly-acted propaganda against Israel. With Hamas, nothing is quite as it seems in their propaganda, and when it's real, it's straight-out horrifying. But since 2017, they've shown signs of mellowing, sort of accepting the idea of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. Still, they're knee-deep in violent tactics, like missile strikes against Israel, 
which has drawn global criticism for breaking international laws. Since Hamas took over Gaza in 2007, it's been a bit of a mess. Fatah runs the West Bank, while Hamas rules Gaza, and they don't get along. This has caused a lot of problems and stopped them from working together. Countries like the US, the EU and Israel don't recognize Hamas as a legit government. But the Arab League hopes things can go back to how they were before all this trouble started. What's up with human rights under Hamas and the global take on it? Under Hamas's rule in Gaza, the darker shades of governance are pretty hard to miss, especially when it comes to exploiting kids and gagging the press. Let's start with child soldiers. It's basically no secret that the rights of kids, like getting an education and staying out of armed conflict, are being thrown out the window. The rules are clear. The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court and the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child say no to child soldiers. But campaigns like UNICEF's Children Not Soldiers are shouting from the rooftops that this is a real problem in Hamas-controlled areas. Now, about the media in Gaza. Calling press freedom limited under Hamas is like saying the Sahara is a bit dry. Journalists are walking on eggshells, scared of stepping out of line, especially on sensitive topics like rocket launches. The result? A media scene that's censored to the hilt, where finding an unbiased report is like finding a needle in a haystack. Speaking of political dissent, it's pretty much a no-go zone. Human Rights Watch could fill a library with reports on arbitrary arrests, torment, and other horrible things by Hamas, aimed at squashing any opposition. Doesn't matter if you're a protester, activist, or journalist, step out of line, and you're in for it. They might dress it up in legal jargon, but it's just smoke and mirrors for some serious human rights violations. Torments and kangaroo courts are standard in the Hamas justice system. Stories of detainees getting roughed up, even those accused of non-political crimes, are everywhere. Fair trials and due process? Those concepts are as alien to them as a snowstorm in the desert. The military courts, which are basically puppets of Hamas, often turn a blind eye to obvious signs of tormented innocent civilians, adding to a culture where pretty much anything goes. And the global reaction to these human rights horrors? Well, it's been pretty lackluster. Sure, various countries back the Palestinian authorities, but the chronic torments and horrible things by these groups, including Hamas, is a big, thorny issue. They might have signed up to international human rights treaties, but sticking to those standards seems more like a when it suits them kind of deal. What's the latest drama between Hamas and Fatah? Hamas, comfortably perched on their throne in Gaza since 2007. They see themselves as the big shots, the undeniable voice of the Palestinian people, with Fatah playing second fiddle in the West Bank. Imagine two squabbling siblings, each insisting they're the rightful heir to the family fortune, only this time, the fortune is a whole region, with millions of lives precariously dangling in the balance. Now let's rewind to 2004, when British intelligence, MI6, fancied themselves as the grand strategists, secretly cooking up a security recipe for the fata-led Palestinian Authority. Their master plan? A sneaky, let's take down Hamas operation. But oh, how the tables turned. Hamas clinched the 2006 elections, leaving the British with egg on their faces. A classic case of a cunning plan, backfiring spectacularly. Fast forward to 2005, and Israel, in a move that can only be described as washing its hands of the whole Gaza mess, significantly stirred the pot. This wasn't just any old policy shift. It was part of a grander scheme to disengage, inadvertently setting the stage for more chaos and power plays. Then there's the ongoing popularity contest, or should I say unpopularity contest, in Palestinian politics. Both Fatah and Hamas seem to be vying for the title of least admired. 
Mahmoud Abbas and his Fatah gang are barely scraping by in the popularity stakes, while Hamas isn't exactly the people's favorite either. It's a bleak race to the bottom, with both groups desperately trying to stay relevant in the eyes of their people. Hamas has a tough time because they can't get much help. They're getting by with money from people who moved away and some special charities. Gaza's economy is really bad, especially with the stuff Hamas is doing, and it's not getting better. They get some help from other countries, and Israel is oddly letting Qatar send some money to Hamas. Attempts at Fatah Hamas reconciliation have been about as successful as a chocolate teapot. Add in the meddling of regional players like Syria and Iran, and the influence of heavyweights like the US and Israel, and you've got a recipe for perpetual stalemate. The sad punchline? Neither Fatah nor Hamas are the people's champions, but they keep floating, buoyed by foreign aid and their own tangled bureaucracies. So hit like, subscribe, and tell us. How has Hamas's evolution from a quiet branch of the Muslim Brotherhood to a controversial player in Palestinian politics affected their image and actions on the world stage?